hand over to um, Ed, to Edel on the CPN60UT, the perfect market to identify and characterize phytoplasmus. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I'm going to turn my um, camera off and off you go. So thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. I think that is an amazing initiative and um, be able to see some science during this COVID-19 crisis. And the name of my presentation is CBN60 UT, uh, the perfect market to identify and characterize phytoplasmas. So uh, I have to first say that this uh, presentation is putting together all the work I did from the PhD um, until very recent. And even when phytoplasm is not going to be the center of my lab now as an assistant professor here at University Laval, is going to still be part of my research. So phytoplasmas are a unculturable plant pathogenic a bacteria, member of the genus Candidatus phytoplasma, and they are transmitted by insects uh, mainly leaf hoppers. So my first encounter with phytoplasma was in Cuba when I was working in a research institute that take care of fruits. So we found phytoplasma affecting macadamia and nuts. This was really interesting and you can see the symptoms, phytoplasmas induce a very characteristic symptoms in the plants, can be short plants, can be little leaves and can even turn flowers uh, into leaf-like tissue. So the second time I was able to identify phytoplasma was also in Cuba and was affecting a tropical fruit known as sapodilla. This fruit is really important in many countries in Latin America and Asia. And in Cuba, we were trying to see if this fruit could be uh, more productive. So sadly, we found a uh, phytoplasma affecting this plant. Because phytoplasma, uh, well, first, phytoplasma are really important for the economy. We have a few examples the, of a devastating disease called a yellow, um, yellowing, lethal yellowing uh, of coconuts can also affect palms. This is in Florida, for example. We have the flavescence doré. It's a disease that affects grapes and it's a really important disease in wine industry, for example, in France. And we have a, a aster yellow affecting canola. So canola is really, really important for uh, some province here in Canada. And you can see that this plant didn't produce any seeds, flowers, or anything because it was affected by phytoplasma. So it's a big problem for some countries. So one of the main things you need to know is um, what is affecting the plant. So diagnostic and taxonomy is very important for plant pathologists because if we don't know what we have, we don't know how to manage it. So because it is um, unculturable, the uh, diagnostic method has to be through molecular biology. So besides um, the genus, something interesting is that the genus was uh, um, defined uh, in 2005, so which is Fair, uh, fairly recent compared to other organisms. Before 2005, the taxonomists and people working with phytoplasma found that they could be uh, identified in groups and subgroups. So the groups and subgroups uh, is based on the 16S because it's a bacteria, but what they did was to amplify a fragment inside the 16S a operon called F2NR2. This, from, this uh, DNA fragment was then digested with 17 restriction enzymes. And I'm talking about the 90s where the RFLP restriction enzyme pattern was something really big. So this was found that with 17 enzymes, you were able then 
to run the digestion and then you had a unique pattern for every um, for every phytoplasma. So based on this, then they had the similarity coefficients and they, de they defined that um, strains with more than 0.97 would be a same subgroup. And if they had more than 0.85 would be the same group. So to date, there are a more than 38 groups and a lot of subgroups. In 2016, in a work with colleagues from here, from Canada, we identified the last some groups that they were more than A to Z. So now we have even two letters, so complicated as you can see. It was so complicated that the, this group that defined this RFLP method, they also developed an online tool. And in this tool, you will be able to uh, sequence the 16S, the FN2R2 fragment, and then copy and paste here. And then this tool, an online tool, would tell you the group, subgroup, species, and will give you the in silico RFLP pattern. So this makes things a little bit easier because you can imagine that many groups around the world will have, and more in those years, uh, wouldn't have uh, the money to buy the 17 restriction enzymes. So this is how phytoplasma is uh, identified and is classified. This is still where uh, is how it is done. So, you know, 16S uh, can be a tricky uh, marker for phytoplasma because phytoplasma have two copies of the 16S and sometimes these copies are different. Uh, they are different. So you can have a phytoplasma with two different subgroups or groups. So um, many people have tried to use different markers. And one of those markers is Broel, um, which is chaperonin 60 or CBN60. So they found that using that uh, marker, they were able to identify closely related strains, but only in the group one. So this is the first time that a Groel or CBN60 was used, but only for group one. They didn't know what was happening with other groups. Something really interesting is that a group here in Canada, a lead, a lead by Janet Hill a, in the veterinary a school in Saskatchewan, they identified that a, a portion of Groel or CBN60 called CBN60 universal target was enough, almost 600 per base per was enough to differentiate a bacteria, members of the domain bacteria. This was really interesting because also in Saskatchewan, they were working with a phytoplasma. So Tim Dumonso, which is a long time um, collaborator with Janet Hill, he decided to uh, explore if CBN60 UT was also a able to differentiate phytoplasma. So he found that uh, he signed some primers and then um, he found that indeed CBN60 UT was also a good, very good marker for phytoplasma. And it's in this moment where I uh, start to collaborate with Tim and Crystal Olivier from here, from, well, from Saskatchewan, I'm now in Quebec City, but um, I was able to provide a group nine phytoplasma from Cuba. And then we start this a long time collaboration. So my PhD work was with mice bushy stunt, which is a, a disease affecting corn in Latin America. It's found from South US to Argentina and I think even Chile. So I was interested to see if this phytoplasma was affecting native corn 
in a small communities in Mexico. And we found that indeed it's in native corn in Mexico, but this was the first time that we um, study a CBN 60 UD and it was really interesting because using 16S, we just found that was a group one B, nothing interesting, but using CBX60, we found two different variants or isolates, uh, you can call it. So this was really interesting. We found then that CBN60UT could elucidate a diversity contained into the 16S operon. So if you use 16S, we wouldn't find anything. Using CBN60UT, we found that we had two different um, isolates of the pathogen. So we kept then using CBN60, and this is another collaboration uh, I was able to do with a Driscoll a company that commercialized berries around the world. And we found these amazing symptoms affecting raspberry, strawberry, and blackberry. So with 16S it was super interesting because we had information in literature about the two copies of the 16S, but here we found it uh, ourselves. So we found that this phytoplasma was group 13 and it had two different 16S. So we had to use CPN60 in order to develop diagnostic methods in reliable, fast, and easy to use. And then we studied the diversity of the phytoplasma in, the, in some states in the center of Mexico. If we wouldn't use CBN60 in this experiment, we probably would think that it was a, a double infection because you have two copies of the 16S and then you had to use a, a single copy gene to be able to, uh, to believe there was only one phytoplasma. So, the phytoplasma community is a, a little bit a old school. We, a, many authors a, try to use different a, markers, but to be able to pass the filter of reviewers and the filter of the community, they were always using the RFLP a, method, even with, with other markers. So I said, <clears throat> well, let's try to find some, um, some restriction enzymes that are able to cut and provide a unique pattern for the CBN60 UT. So I did that, we amplify the CBN60 UT and then using seven restriction enzymes, and this is, we went from 10, uh, 17, to a seven, so we cut 10 restriction enzymes. Using only seven, we were able to identify a unique pattern for each of the strains that at least we had the CBN60 UD. And this is something that a, it was a, a stop for us to do it before because we only had a six, a six seven a sequence at that time and then with the uh, increase of genome sequencing and increase of our work, we were able to have more, to be able to validate this. So I also found uh, some uh, similarity coefficient threshold that we could separate groups and subgroups based on CBN60 UT. So we did that and we were able to publish uh, this work and here, for example, in this figure, we have a 1, 1C, 1E, 1F, and 1P in the group one, and they all have a, a unique RFLP pattern. So we have right now a coherent scheme to differentiate phytoplasmas based on CBN60 UT. So then, uh, I start to hunt phytoplasmas, and that's how I call it because a uh, phytoplasma doesn't have a, um, we don't have a collection for phytoplasma because they are not culturable. So basically, to 
have more sequence, you have to find more plants affected by phytoplasma. So that's what I did uh, for a long time. This is, for example, in Peru, we found a uh, group 15 affecting grapes and also papaya. You can see the disease called papaya bushy stop and grapevine yellow disease. So group 15, new CPN60 UT uh, in the world because nobody had amplified before this marker from the uh, group 15. Then we found phytoplasma in Canada, and this is interesting. This was the second time we found two different copies of the 16S. This one is group one, and one copy was a subgroup E, and the other was a new subgroup. And this is an example of what I told you. Now it's two letters. So the, the classification scheme is very, very complicated using the 16S. But still, we have to use it because it's the a gold standard. So here was affecting a blueberries in Canada. And again, we use the CBN60. Another example of hunting phytoplasma is a new group a, for the 16, new subgroup for the 16S and also CBN60 UD. And this was in Saudi Arabia affecting wild plants. And we also found the unique RFLP pattern then another example is now to be able to um, make CBN60 even uh, wider in the community, I start to use both classification uh, for the strains, the CBN60 and the 16S. So here is an example that uh, is affecting grass, phytoplasma affecting grass in Mexico. Uh, and now something really interesting. We had a, there was hint in the literature that the group three didn't have CBN60 um, at all. So, but we struggled a lot to get DNA from group three from different countries. So I was very lucky that one day I was just walking in my city in Mexico and I see this plant, a periwinkle, is a very good plant to identify phytoplasma because you can see beautiful green flowers. So I was walking, I saw the symptoms, then we identified that was indeed a group three. So we found that with the 16S, it had a two different strain of phytoplasma, really interesting, new in North America, but we said, well, this is the perfect opportunity to know if the group three has indeed CBN60. So we did genome sequencing of this strain and big surprise, we didn't find a CBN60 in the group three phytoplasma. So what can be happening here? Well, phytoplasmas are a members of the class molecules and in molecules, this is a phylogenetic tree for molecules, have been identified that CBN60 is absent in some of, mole some of the molecules. The explanation is because uh, these, these uh, molecules have all the proteins that have been doing the functions of CBN60. So this is really interesting. Maybe the group three has all the proteins that are doing what CBN60 should do. So, but the other interesting thing is that have been lateral gene transfer in some uh, molecules, meaning that they got CBN60 from other organisms. So maybe we are missing CBN60 UT because we can't uh, get it once we do the alignments and the enrichment of the sequence during genome sequencing. But this is something that we have to explore. It's something really interesting, and it can be a negative uh, point for this marker because it's not present in a, one of the phytoplasma groups. So, so far, uh, using those primates from 2014, 
we have been able to amplify CBN60 UD from 12 groups, 21 subgroups, and 11 species. So this is really big because taking into account that there is no collection, we have been able to hunt a lot of phytoplasmas. So at this moment, I had this idea, in, I had this fixation basically in my mind that I wanted to do an online tool like the CBN60 classifier to be able to facilitate the work with CBN60. Sadly, uh, my programming skills are not good. So we had to find somebody to help Tim and I uh, to, uh, to be able to do this. So we found an amazing uh, programmer, his name is Kevin, and he said, yes, I'll do it. So we just explained everything to him, what we wanted, uh, how this classification scheme works, and he uh, managed to develop CPN60 classifier. So this is a tool that we can also copy and paste CBN60 UT and we will know what is the phytoplasma in that, uh, that belong in that sequence. So once we copy and paste the, the, the sequence, we are able to then know what is the closest strain uh, in our database then we will know what is the subgroup and then we the the researcher can even get the in silico rflp pattern for each strain your query strain and also the closer strain so we you can compare so here we have the the figure here so we can also know where are located the different uh, restriction sites for the seven restriction enzymes. He, the researcher can also get the matrix uh, with the similarity coefficient. Then this is something completely new. We can have uh, a, a, the tree, the um, um, phylogenetic tree. So it's a uh, life. So you can get the tree, you can uh, know what is the strain closet, not only with the RFLP, but also phylogenetically. So something also really amazing is that uh, we have a CBN6 CUT collection. So here we have the collection for the plasmids. Uh, they are, uh, I, I, I'm almost sure that they are already in a gene, so freely available. If you're working with CBN60 UT, you can ask for those uh, uh, plasmids and they can be positive control uh, for the amplification, for primers, for um, restriction, if you want to do the restriction analysis uh, in the lab, so you can have that. So this is unique for phytoplasma. There is no collection, but here you have a CBN60 UT phytoplasma collection. Something also really, amazing to work with CBN60 is that a Janet Hill group, they managed to develop this CBN60 database. So you have a, this amazing database that you can access to the information of different uh, chaperoning. You can have the sequence and it's curated and it's uh, up to date, so it's amazing. So a lot of advantage working with CBN60. So the last thing that we are doing right now is I'm trying to uh, publish this work and this work is going to be only using CBN60 uh, UT and the classifier. So we found this phytoplasma again in beautiful symptoms affecting daisies in Mexico. And even when I amplified the 16S, I wanted to publish uh, this study only a using CBN60 classifier. So here we have the tree using CBN60 classifier is a phytoplasma in group one. It's nothing uh, that exciting because group one is very uh, widely uh, present in around the world. 
And here we have the RFLP pattern generated uh, with a CBN60 classifier. So really interesting. We are struggling to pass it through reviewers because they are really uh, used to a 16S. And yes, we amplify 16S, but we only talk about the CBN60 UT classification in this paper. So again, if you ask me, if CBN60 UT is the perfect market uh, to identify and characterize phytoplasma, I have to say um, it is a single copy, so that's a lot of advantage. It's a short sequence, meaning that the PCR is going to be fast, not like 16S that can be even two hours. Um, the CBN60 is also able to differentiate closely related strains, so you are not going to misclassify a, any phytoplasma. We have an online tool that allows in silico classification, so this is really handy and good. A, we have a CBN60 UT phytoplasma clones collection, so this is also unique. You can have your positive control no doubt that is going to work. And well, if you are working uh, with the group three, then I have to say no, it's not the perfect uh, market. But if you're working with any other phytoplasma, it is, in my opinion, the perfect market. So with this, I have to say thank you to uh, Tim Dumonso, Crystal, uh, Jennifer, and many, many amazing people that have supported this research and the institutions. So thank you very much. Thank you, that was really incredible research and it's a wonderful platform um, for other people to access and I hope people use this as a teaching tool as well. <laughs> so I'm gonna open up um, the question and answers so anyone that has any question answers are welcome to type them in um, at the question and answer. But while that's happening, I thought I would ask some basic questions. Um, <laughs> when you started um, looking at the phytoplasmas, how often do you think we are, um, as plant pathologists even, walking past plants and it's something that we don't see? Um, how often do you think this is happening? Oh, I think, yeah, I think it's happening a lot. Uh, it's interesting, uh, recently I've, I've been seeing a, a lot of people asking, what is this symptom, what is this symptoms? And many of those look like phytoplasma, but if you read the answers, uh, people say virus, people say, uh, you know what? It's interesting when trips feed of young shoots, it also uh, create these symptoms that can be bushy up. We and um, no, we call it a um, witch's broom, a witch broom. So, uh, so I think that many times phytoplasma are um, just passed by. You know, like we don't know uh, uh, if it's phytoplasma or if it's an insect. I think that uh, many times you have to go to the molecular level to, to be sure. But yeah, I, I developed a really, good, a really good eye to see phytoplasma in everything. <laughs> um, I, have a quick, I have a question here I'm from Manesh from India. Um, and he'd like to know about on or in-field diagnostic techniques that are used. Do you oh. think something like what you've developed um, could be made more, I want to say, like the little portable that we've seen for some of the rats? Well, uh, Tim Dumonso group, uh, he was part of my supervisor during the PhD. We developed lamp. We developed a lamp for phytoplasma. This was for group 13. We are right now working in group one for different crops. And you can do it. We have the Gini 3. The Gini 3 is really, really tiny. It's like this, and you have for eight samples, and you can just go to the field. We recently developed also a DNA, a DNA extraction using FTA cards. You just have to punch 
the insect or the plant sample, and then you get the DNA. So everything can be done in the field. So from the DNA extraction to the diagnostic, really quick. If the sample has a lot of phytoplasma, we can even see uh, the curve uh, growing in like 10 minutes, the amplification. Can be as fast as 10 minutes. The other way is a uh, mean ion, the nanopore a technology. With the mean ion, you can also do everything in the field. And there is some studies already doing that, but with phytoplasma, it's completely possible. I think you got I, I'm getting more and more fascinated by the, the movement of technology um, that's, that's changing. So as you said, uh, this is, you said the phytoplasm community are rather old school. Um, why do you think there's, I don't want to call it resistance, but uh, uh, resistance to moving <laughs> from the 16S to the CPN 60? You know, it's interesting. Uh, that paper was uh, rejected just really recent, last Friday. <laughs> but it was rejected. Uh, still, we might have a chance there, but um, the one reviewer said, I really like it. I, I have nothing bad to say. The second reviewer was, you need the 16 years. <laughs> And is the school. I think uh, young researchers or uh, people that is starting to work with phytoplasma is more open because there is so much evidence saying that the 16S can be tricky, that it's better to use a single copy protein codifying a marker. Uh, but the old school is with the 16S because that's what people use for bacteria is a lot of people use that for bacteria. It's also a, you have the, the background of the literature, you know, and sometimes it's just easy to follow the, to follow the line. Yeah. It's complicated when you use something new. Yeah, I agree. I think that's also what's really great about having um, the, the CPA classifier, um, platform online because everyone it's kind of getting people on board with moving forward and the way that things can potentially change so um you said that this isn't going to be a major focus of your new research how do you hope to keep that alive going forward well uh, my the center of my research now uh, is going to be club root uh, which susan uh, give, gave a talk about club root so she gave a perfect introduction. And so her, if you have any doubt, go to her talk uh, on YouTube. It's really, really good. But a uh, phytoplasma is going to be a uh, still part of my research because here in Quebec, we have a blueberry stunt phytoplasma, which is a pathogen that can kill the plant really quick. So we have seen that the plants can be uh, dead from one, two years after we found the phytoplasma, we seen the plant have symptoms. So ideally, we will be able to detect the phytoplasma before the plant start to have a lot of symptoms. So we will use a diagnostic methods based on CP and 60 UT. So the main use here for, for us is to develop fast diagnostic methods because we have an accurate, we have this phytoplasma, that have two 16S copies. So the best way is to go with a diagnostic that can target a, C a, a good marker like cpn 60 ut So basically, we, I will use it for a diagnostic. And if we see symptoms of something new, we, of course, we will use the, the first thing I do now when I see a phytoplasma is amplify cpn 60 because it's quick, short, no mistakes uh, when you send to sequencing, like can happen in bigger uh, fragments. So everything is really quick with CBN60. Yeah, and that's great because the faster we can identify the issue, the better we can manage our pathogens or mm -hmm. our diseases. Yeah. And also and so something we, oh, sorry. Also uh, okay. something that we will use it too 
is to try to identify the insect uh, transmitting the pathogen. We still don't know which one is the, the vector. So to do this uh, screening, we will use CBN16 for sure. Well, you took the word question right out of my mouth because I was just about to say, are there specific um, insects that are associated and what are some of the um, fallbacks um, or safety nets that you can use for the group three? So for the group three, we, we are going to uh, six <laughs> okay. So yeah, but uh, uh, there are a few other markers. You can use uh, the RP operon, you can use the RPOB. Uh, RPOB is a little bit big uh, for what I like. So <laughs> I like uh, shorter markers mainly, but uh, you can have the RP operon have different a different proteins that you can amplify a different sequences. So you you have to use a different market, definitely for group three. Uh, my last question then focuses on, um, in the beginning we were talking about the, the cost for um, countries that do not necessarily have the resources. So this is something that really will assist countries like that. Um, how, how many other researchers do you know of that are actually open to using this tool for diagnostic purposes that is linked to management? Yeah, this is interesting because I started my research with phytoplasma in Cuba and we barely had any research. So uh, we were lucky that we had uh, to amplify a sequence, but then sequencing was complicated and not even thinking about the digestion, something with 17 enzymes. We never had that in the lab, for sure. So this was a really good, something that I always had in mind, how the online tool was helping me when I was using 16S in Cuba. So I always wanted to develop this tool because I knew that would be really useful for a third world countries a, that Agriculture is really important that they don't have money for insecticide. So this is something really interesting. When you see the main countries working with phytoplasmas are countries that they can't really manage the insect vector properly, you know? So you don't see corn affected with phytoplasma in US or in big countries, but you see it in countries with more problems to manage the vector. So I know for a fact that researchers in Mexico are starting to use CBN60 now. So they are a, in Mexico, a, a coconut industry is seriously affected by phytoplasma. So researchers working with that in Mexico, they are starting to amplify CBN60 and trying to use the online tool too. So that's something good. In Italy, also we have a, so we are knowing everybody that is using the tool because we implemented a, a registration to the tool. <laughs> so in this way, we know who is using the tool and if they want to register, for example, a new strain or a new group, they can also do it, but we will have the information of those researchers. So. Uh, I think we are seeing uh, a lot of more traffic now. Hopefully this talk increased the interest. And once we publish also that work with Phytoplasma in Mexico, we hope that more people will see how handy it is. I definitely think so. And I, I hope so too. I think it's really important to have your academic research published, but it's really it's something that I've been reading a lot about as plant pathologists to really get our research out into the field and into practice. So thank you very much, et al, for your time today. Do you have anything that you'd like to um, close off with? No, no, thank you very much for this opportunity. I think that open plant pathology is an amazing thing that, uh, as always, uh, we are going 
uh, forward many other research areas, plant pathologists, <laughs> trying to be open and trying to share uh, knowledge with, the, with everybody. Yeah, so thank you very much. I just want to give you a, some feedback from one of the participants. They say thank you very much for answering the question. Um, it will help um, them pursuing their career in the future. And this is one of the few comments that we've actually received back. So uh, really, thank you very much for making the time to meet with us today. And all the best for your research and the new opportunity for you in Quebec. Perfect. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.